Uh, it's okay. I'm. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We can hear. I was just going to announce your uh, title of the. Of yes. The talk. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Professor Pajev is going to present us um, a report on uh, ligand and structure-based studies of natural flavonoids from the plant Silibum marianum. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to know, do you hear me? You hear me and do you see my presentation? We see it, it's not on full screen yet. Uh, it's just a moment. Know. Yes. Okay. So, good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending on the time zone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and especially Professor Anel Ivanova for uh, giving us uh, the possibility to show you our results uh, as a success story in virtual drug development. Uh, as the title of the presentation shows, um, uh, the study will uh, discuss not only structure-based methods, which are the topic of the school, but also some uh, ligand-based methods. And uh, we hope that it will be interesting for the participants. Uh, the authors of the presentations are all uh, members of the QSAR and Molecular Modeling Department in the Institute of Biophysics and Biomedical Engineering of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. and. Let us start. The, the presentation is structured as a classical study, starting from the rational, uh, formulating some questions, then a description of the data and the methods, then the results will be present with, uh, give, by giving answers to the questions uh, set above. Uh, this will be done by three case studies. And finally, some conclusions will be drawn uh, to show the outcome of our results. What is the rational of our study? The title of the slide shows this is the importance of natural product for uh, drug development. Uh, particularly the bioactive natural products were a source for medical treatment and preparations uh, from uh, millennium, but they are very much used also in the modern drug discovery. Here you see the pie uh, uh, taken from a very recent publication showing how uh, the uh, new approval in the 40 uh, years, uh, past years, worldwide, that means not only Food and uh, Drug Administration Agency data, um, are distributed according to their type. And uh, one can easily calculate that about 50% of all newly drug approval uh, in some way are related to natural products. They are either natural products or they are derivatives or they mimic the function of natural product or contain a natural product pharmacophores. This comes to show how important are natural products for the drug discovery and development. Uh, the next thing that motivated us uh, is the fact that the medicinal plants uh, in Bulgaria, um, that Bulgaria is rich in medicinal plants. We have about 750 species, uh, 200 of them are currently in use, and 30 to 40 medicinal and aromatic plants are cultivated. Six of them are most important among those uh, cultivated, and uh, uh, among them is uh, the plant we are interested in. This is Silibum marianum, uh, or known in the folk medicine as the milk thistle. So, what is famous this compound uh, with? Uh, the, the seeds and the roots of the compound are used to get the so-called silymarine extract, 
uh, which standard application is for treatment of liver diseases, cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis, um, diseases associated with uh, increased alcohol consumption and um, exposure to environmental toxins. Um, the new and emergent applications of uh, this extract uh, reveal a number of new effects to mention several anti-cancer, cardio and neuroprotective uh, treatment of uh, different diseases of lung, pancreas, prostate and kidney. And um, uh, all these uh, uh, compound, all these effects particularly put several questions when using this silymarine extract. And uh, what were the questions uh, we uh, put to ourselves? Using in silico methods, can we understand more about admit properties of the silymarine compounds? We focused on the prediction of gastrointestinal absorption, and this was our case study one. And the second question was uh, using in silico methods, can we understand more about the mechanism faction of the silymarine compounds? And in this case, we focused on the interaction with and prediction of potential protein targets in the human organism of the silymarine compounds. And these were our case studies two and three. Uh, the abbreviation ADMET, you know from the previous lectures, uh, uh, this stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity associated with the pharmacokinetic stage of the drug action. Uh, as any in silico study, uh, this one starts with uh, defining data. Uh, silymarine is a mixture of compounds, but in, in silico we need, we need a defined structure. And here you see the main active ingredients in silymarine. Those are seven compounds, among them silibin A and silibin B, which are the isomers. Also, uh, uh, their dehydro derivatives, uh, dehydrosilibin A and B, these are mostly representatives of the class of uh, flavonolignans, but we have also some flavonoids like taxifolin. The main methods, they are in silico or computer-aided drug design, as uh, stated in the, tape, in the title, uh, representatives of ligand and structure-based methods. Um, it, each group has its advantages and disadvantages. And if one can combine uh, both methods when possible, one can really uh, do more effective research. Uh, among the ligand-based methods, we use uh, QSAR modeling, uh, also uh, virtual uh, ligand-based screening, um, estimating similarity between compounds, between ligands, and uh, among the, stru the structure-based methods, we use docking. Uh, all these methods will be given, um, for these methods will be given more details in the further presentation. Let us start with the case study one. Uh, we aimed at the prediction of gastrointestinal absorption and focused in particularly on defining or uh, calculating the membrane permeability of the compounds, having in mind that the membrane permeability correlates very well with the gastrointestinal absorption. Uh, the technique or the method we used is the QSR model. Most of you know that in general, it correlates any activity or property data of the ligands uh, with uh, structural descriptors or molecular descriptors of the compounds. Uh, different kinds of multivariate statistical methods can be used uh, to draw this dependence, uh, but in this case, we used the multiple linear regression of two parameters. Here you, you see a schematic presentation of the idea. Uh, if we have two uh, independent variables, x1 and x2, using the least square method, we are trying to build a plane that, cause, that uh, passes simultaneously most close to all points. These are the projection of the points by x1 and x2 in the space. 
And uh, in our case, the dependent variable, the y value, was the effective permeability coefficient measured by PAMPA methodology. This has also been mentioned in the previous lecture. These are parallel artificial membrane permeability assay. Then log G, um, uh, the distribution coefficient at pH seven um, and the topological polar surface area and molecular weight uh, have been used as structural descriptors. Uh, the distribution coefficient uh, we calculated by in two ways by Chemaxon Marvin and also using uh, the FISCHEM suite of perceptor. And the uh, topological polar surface area and molecular weight were calculated by the nine uh, CDK9 nodes. The equation itself in, in its complete form uh, with all statistical results is shown on the slide. Um, it is based on data of uh, about 250 compounds. You see that we have relatively good statistical parameters, I would say even very good. We calculated not only the fitting coefficient presented here by the adjusted R square, but also the predictive uh, uh, coefficients uh, by leap one out method and by splitting the data set into the training and test set uh, correspondingly shown on the plot in green and red. Um, the plot presents the dependence between the experimental and calculated by the model log p values. And uh, you can see that there is a very good correlation between both. We further tested the capability of model to predict GIA assessed on a set of 780 compounds with known gastrointestinal absorption. Where are our seven uh, compounds from the silymarin uh, in this model? Uh, it is shown here uh, again, the same plot, and in the black dots, you see uh, our compounds. So uh, they have been experimentally tested also uh, to predict their membrane permeability. You see that uh, the compounds fall into the applicability domain of the model, and uh, five out of seven um, uh, go to the uh, half of the model, uh, which uh, uh, shows a high permeability of this uh, membrane permeability of these compounds. Um, this model gave us a hope that we can also predict uh, the, the membrane permeability of um, non-tested uh, flavonolignans. And we did this for 31 uh, compounds and for 27 of them, we found uh, good uh, permeability in the high permeability in the gastrointestinal tract, but this hasn't be, been yet experimentally proven. The next study uh, relates to the interaction of our compounds with the nuclear recept estrogen receptor alpha. In fact, we were interested in toxicity of these compounds uh, due to their uh, broader use and uh, performing silico prediction using the Derek Nexus expert system. And um, the result was that the stereoisomers, silicon A and silicon B, are able to modulate the function of the uh, and, uh, estrogen receptor alpha in, mam in mammals without, of course, giving any uh, differences in the prediction of their effects. And thus, uh, we decided to perform docking in the uh, binding site of the uh, estrogen receptor alpha. Here you see the ligand binding domain uh, with bound uh, endogenous ligand estradiol uh, and um, the activation helix 12, which is very important for the function of this uh, receptor in the agonist and antagonist conformation. Uh, we used uh, two uh, softwares, um, MOE and GOAT. Um, uh, the docking was uh, semi-flexible, solvent was considered. Semi-flexible docking in this case means um, 
uh, rigid receptor and flexible ligand, but I have to say that we also load uh, the side chains of the amino acids facing the pocket uh, to be also uh, flexible. Uh, and here, I would like to draw your attention on the fact that uh, two positions of uh, uh, the activation helix were taken into account. Why? I think that uh, in all structure-based studies, it is very important to pay attention to what crystal structure, 3D structure of protein or enzyme we are using, because they could be different depending on the functional state um, they are. This is especially important for the nuclear receptors and also for the transport proteins. The binding site was defined by the ligand. Uh, here I give the data about um, uh, the PDP complexes used. And the scoring functions were London DG in MOE and GOAT score in GOAT. Both are empirical scoring functions that um, uh, consider not only uh, contribution to the enthalpy, but also to the entropy of the interaction energies. Uh, I think that in the previous presentation, in the first one, uh, was given the formula, the formula for the London DG. I will not go into the detail more about. And we did observe some differences in the interactions of our silibin A and B in the binding site. This is illustrated here. Um, and the uh, differences in the poses uh, suggest some stereospecific interactions. Interestingly, in most cases, we recorded hydrogen bond interactions of silibin B and no specific interactions for silibin A in most of the poses. Uh, thus, we were looking for the experimental confirmation of our results, and we were very happy to find in vitro study that stated about silibin B and not silibin A to be responsible for the partial mediated activity in relation to the estrogen receptor alpha of silimarin. And in this way, we could explain at the molecular level the different the experimentally, experimentally observed differences in the activity of uh, both silibins on, the, on this nuclear receptor. The case study three is related to the discovery or to the, uh, our trial to discover new protein targets of the silimarin compounds. The research strategy is based on the fundamental principle in drug action, uh, complementarity between the drug and its uh, binding or receptor binding site in two dimensions, shape similarity and uh, shape complementarity, uh, sorry, and complementarity of the surface properties or surface potentials. The extrapolation of this idea of complementarity between the drug and its binding site could be given to the ligands only, uh, meaning that we can look for ligands that are similar in shape and also similar in their surface properties. And we use the ROC software uh, uh, under the Open I Free Academic License Program to perform uh, such similarity assessment. You see here on the left, uh, the shape correspondence and uh, the correspondence in the surface properties is done by the so-called uh, color similarity, meaning uh, identification of um, functional groups, atoms, and substructures capable of performing similar uh, intramolecular uh, interactions like acceptor, donor, hydrophobic, aromatic, ionic, and so on. The similarity has been estimated using the Tanimoto coefficient. The most simplified form of the Tanimoto coefficient is shown here. Uh, the number of features of one molecule, of the other molecule, the common features between them. But um, when we try to estimate uh, more complex properties like shape and uh, functional similarities. Uh, the form is much more complicated. We have non-binary data. Uh, the features are presented at uh, bits uh, sets in the fingerprints. And uh, we calculated the Tanimoto combo coefficient, combining shape and uh, color similarity together. Therefore, the 
coefficient ranges from zero, meaning no similarity, to two, meaning full similarity. The slide shows the workflow of um, uh, the um, uh, search. Uh, we used all approved drugs from the drug bank. To that time, they were about 200, uh, 2,300, meaning we know everything about these drugs. We know their structures. We know their effects. We don't know their targets, what, what is very important. And uh, we found nine drugs for silibine uh, and their dehydro derivatives to have Tanimoto scores above 0 0.9 and two of them uh, to be uh, similar to drugs with with anti-tumor activity. And then the question was, can silibines and their derivatives interact with the same targets as the similar anti-tumor drugs do? Here we summarize the values of the Tanimoto combo indices and show what are those two drugs. One of them is Vemurofenib, and it is um, used uh, for treatment of metastatic melanoma, and its target protein is the protein kinase BRAF. And this modigib, which is uh, mostly used for treatment of uh, basal cell carcinoma, and this, uh, the target protein is mutant receptor. Uh, no, but before to proceed further with studying the interactions of our compounds with those two target proteins, we perform additional check using more software by flexible alignment of compounds on the drugs by active conformations as extracted from their 3D complexes and uh, mapped properties on their molecular, in this case, connolly surfaces to see how they correspond to each other. And this is seen here. Uh, on the left, you see the shape alignment between dehydrosilubines in green and uh, vemurafinib and bismuthigib in brown. And uh, on the right, uh, the surface properties mapped for bismuthigib and both silibines. Uh, here we have electrostatic and hydrophobic hydrophilic uh, properties. In general, we have um, better correspondence in shape for bismuthigib and uh, relatively good correspondence uh, in the surface properties, I would say good correspondence even in the surface properties between uh, bismuthigib and silibines. We further, as I mentioned, perform docking in the uh, active site of the BRAF kinase. Uh, you, you see here the PDP complex we used. And um, the table reports on the docking scores uh, for the best corpus and the first three, the average of the first three of our four compounds and also Vemurafenib because we redocked our compound into the binding site, uh, uh, our uh, uh, drug into, the into its binding site to get an idea about the docking scores. You see that uh, silibines and dehydrosilibines have lower docking scores compared to Vemurafenib, but still very good. Here you can see uh, their binding in the active sites uh, of silibine A and B and of dehydrosilibine A and B. Uh, I have to say that we especially followed how the interactions compare to the interactions of abemurafenib. And we found that our silibines and dehydrosilibines could do interact with the uh, residues uh, um, uh, uh, Velumorafenib interacts with, and in addition, we um, recorded different interactions, uh, especially evident for dehydrosilibines in uh, in this receptor, but also in the other one. And um, uh, based on that, uh, we concluded that certainly these compounds can interact with BRAF kinase, but it was not enough. And we decided to look for the in vitro validation of our results. And we did perform uh, experiments uh, uh, for inhibiting BRAF kinase uh, in uh, its mutation, which is in 80, 90% of advanced melanoma patients present, uh, valine to uh, glutamic acid in uh, 600 uh, positions. And we found in uh, uh, accordance, in correspondence with our in silico results that dehydrosilibine 
has uh, the highest inhibitory effect compared to the other compounds. Uh, the IC50 of uh, dehydrosilibin was about 25 micromole. Further, we did docking in similarly in the receptor of uh, smooth and homolog. Um, this is the G protein coupled receptors, um, uh, as I said, involved in the heavy Hox signaling pathway, very essential for the cancer diseases development. And again, we found uh, good scores for our compounds compared to this modigib. We perform a strong validation of our in silico results by two assays. Uh, and uh, uh, we found very interestingly that dehydrosilibin A was active while dehydrosilibin B was inactive. Both silibins A and B showed mute activity. And uh, additionally, we performed a displacement assay uh, to, uh, for, the most, uh, for the best compound. And we did find that um, uh, these uh, compounds binds to the small receptor to the smooth and homolog receptor. The main conclusions drawn for our, from our case studies is that in silico methods are really useful. We could predict the membrane permeability in the gastrointestinal tract. We explained at the molecular level stereospecificity and effects when interacting with the estrogen receptor alpha. And we proposed and um, at the level of in vitro experiments, proved that indeed uh, uh, these compounds could interact with two novel targets in the human organism. So we can conclude that in silico methods are very valuable tools when looking for a drug. Here are the publications uh, related to our studies. Um, they all have already been published. We have a lot of uh, support from uh, different programs, also from international projects. They are also mentioned here. And uh, in the end, we formulated three messages to you to take home because we do think that they are important. And th these are also based on our experiment or experience. The first is do not forget, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. This has been said by George Box. So our advice is try to validate experimentally the in silico models and results. Second, follow the principle of parsimony or Occam's razor, meaning all things being approximately equal, one should accept the simplest model. And the third advice is no matter what computational method you are using. Don't get lost in calculations and keep your eye on the goal. And in the end, I'd like to thank for your attention. Thank you. Um, I see that there's one question uh, in the chat. Are those 248 old flavonoids, uh, are there log P values? Uh, and were the oh, sorry, and were the log p values taken from literature or measured all uh, at can once? Can you can you please? Uh, I would like to to read the question. Okay. Uh, show it. Yeah. I well, I cannot show it on your screen. Uh, but uh, you can simply stop sharing my screen. <laughs> uh, so we'll read again. Okay. Are those two hundred forty eight? All flavonoids. Um, no, 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 not. Okay. You mean uh, you mean the model for membrane permeability? No, no, they are different drugs. No. Okay. Uh, and were the log p values taken from the literature or measured all at once? For the model, we had measured uh, membrane permeability coefficients. Otherwise, it was not possible to build this plot of the predicted versus observed. But um, uh, for the silymarine compounds, we did, indeed, we did uh, experimental measurements using pump assay. And uh, this has been shown also by their positions on the plot. 
Okay. Uh, this was a kind of validation of our results. Okay. Uh, how did you select those specific descriptors among the vast number of existing descriptors? Um, the common sense, first of all. Uh, uh, the, the tendency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, uh, the membrane permeability is a very complex property. It depends on many, many factors. Uh, most of them are related to the steric and to the lipophilic or hydrophilic properties of the compounds. And um, uh, of course, uh, one can do also a lot of um, uh, calculations uh, using different descriptors, performing uh, principal component analysis, uh, defining, uh, deriving uh, different kind of um, uh, transformation of the initial set of variables. But we did, uh, we did get very good results with these simple models and with these simple descriptors uh, that fully satisfied us. And therefore we decided to uh, rely on them. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, thank you for the very interesting talk, talk. And now I suggest that we continue with the next presenter. Uh, uh, yes. yes. Uh, I would like only to mention that I have to leave now the session and if there will be any questions to us, uh, I promise to answer later on, uh, if you don't mind, okay? Okay, okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you again. Um, so